Hi, I'm Tim Jones, and I'm an educator. In fact, I've been an educator for more than 30 years. I've given a lot to this noble profession. I'm excited about this opportunity to share with you this afternoon, mostly because I get to talk about something that I love, education. So let me share my screen, and let's get started. So why inequities in education matter? Well, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to discuss this question confidently, intelligently, and logically. So let's talk a little bit about me. Who am I? I'll let you read my background. Although it says significant, <laughs> I'm still at the point of success. I hadn't gotten to significance, but I'm trying. And please disregard that grainy picture. It's the thinnest one I could find. Okay, let's start with an overview. We'll do a quick walkthrough of what you guys can expect throughout the presentation. The welcome, check, it's done. We'll do an icebreaker. It's pretty compelling. Uh, I'm gonna call it uh, a deceptive icebreaker. We'll talk a little bit about why inequities in education matter. We'll look at the compelling whys. We'll look at some facts and figures just to validate some of the, uh, some of the assertions that I'm going to make. And to keep me honest, uh, we'll, we'll look at blue eyes, brown eyes, which is a famous study. We'll get poetic with the bridge builder. It's a pretty famous poem. And then we'll talk a little bit about visibility. Um, so I'll test your vision. And then we'll end on, so what, now what? So let's start the icebreaker. Looks can be deceiving. Some things are easier to see. Let's find the letter C. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, some of you have already located the C. Let's get a little bit more challenging. Some things we force ourselves to see. Can you see both images? Some of you have already seen the old man with his head across his chest, but how many of you see the couple and the dog in the street? Some things we can't see at all. Can you see the mouse among the squirrels? I guess I should let you have a few more moments. For some of you, this is a real challenge, so I'll show you the mouse. Who do you see? Which of these persons is a businessman? Which one is a criminal? Which one's intelligent? Which person is a millionaire? Which person don't you like? Who do you see? So, Already we've set the stage to why education matters. It matters because as we look at education, we have to look at it in its totality. It's not just educating. It's just not education. It's this idea that we owe it to ourselves and our future generations to make them smart, to, to help them reach their fullest potential. And there are only a few ways to do this. So let's read this quote. When students aren't afforded opportunities, it doesn't matter how smart the student is. If they aren't allowed to show, explore, and expand knowledge, he or she will inevitably regress towards the mean. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about regression. Inequities occur and the gap widens, so we must take advantage of rare opportunities to accelerate. Take a look at the diagram here, picture. Think about what that looks like now in society and what it may have looked like years ago. Say 40 years ago, say 50 years ago. How about 60? So let me share my story. I was a pretty cool kid. I was about four years old. I was in a pre-K 
after school uh, center slash day school. It was Miss Jordan's preschool. Miss Jordan was a wonderful young lady. Well, she wasn't so young. She was in her mid 60s, but she was like grandma to us all. We all would go there and have so much fun. Until one day, someone from jo uh, St. Joe's Academy came over. It was a new K2 building. And what she said, the lady that came over, was I'd like to meet some of your students. I'd like to see if we can get them to come to our academy in kindergarten, as opposed to going to their private schools, I'm sorry, their public schools, and that we were a private school and we wanted to offer them a rare opportunity. Well, they tested us, they interviewed us with our parents' permission, of course, and I learned that I was selected. Now, I wasn't one of the smartest kids. Wasn't dumb, but I wasn't one of the smartest. But I think they liked my disposition. So I got a chance to go to St. Joe's for kindergarten. Oh my, oh my. St. Joe's had discovery centers, they had Legos and building blocks. They had a whole theme uh, that looked like a house with a with a kitchen that was my size and um, a living room and a den and an upstairs and a, a loft. This wasn't school. This was like a, a clubhouse. But the best part of all was they had a, a place that they would call the Discovery Zone. And the Discovery Zone had all of these different uh, outfits and costumes. So if I wanted to be a doctor, I just put on my scrubs. If I wanted to be a superhero, I put on my cape. Man, you talk about a joy for learning. Oh, I had it. I was not just accelerating. I was loving the idea of learning. Well, fast forward two years in this wonderful institution, actually two and a half years, and my mother gets upset with my father one day, and she takes me in the middle of the night from West Palm Beach, Florida to Atlanta, Georgia. Well, <laughs> I thought it was okay for a while, but I had to go to school. When I went to school, we had something called a open house, and it was the beginning of uh, third grade. And so <laughs> as we were walking up, I noticed that I was one of the, the rare kids that uh, unfortunately didn't have my dad with me. So let me tell you about Henry Jones. He was what I call an intervening event in my life. And sometimes it takes special people and special circumstances to make you feel like a special person. So many of you may have had a, a dad in your life uh, that was there from birth. Well, my biological father was not there. In fact, he didn't even want anything to do with me. So I spent quite about seven and a half, quite a long time, almost eight years of my life without a father figure. And when my mother met Henry Jones, oh my, I knew she was happy. And she told me she was going to marry this man. And I was happy until they got married found myself crying one day in my, in my bedroom. And Henry Jones, who's now my stepfather, comes in and says, what's wrong? And I said, well, your name's Jones and her name's Joan, but my name's Mitchell. And he said, oh my goodness, I wanna make sure that you are Jones too. In three weeks, my last name became Jones. He adopted me and man, I was on cloud 10. I felt for the first time I belonged, that I was a part of something, that I had a name, that I had value. So you can imagine my mother taking me in the middle of the night away from my father, crossed out step because to me, Henry Jones was my father. And here we are in a new school and he's nowhere to be found. In fact, the next day after open house, when I started my first day of school, a little kid walks up to me and says, you don't got no daddy. And I said, what did you say? And he repeated it. And just like any third grader, I did what most third graders would do. 
I popped him in the nose. In fact, I bloodied his nose. I feel really bad about it now, but at the time, I didn't. I was rushed to the principal's office. And as a result of my behavior, he put me in a special class. He said I was EBD. EBD. Do you know what that means? It meant that I had some type of emotional, behavioral disorder. He thought that something was wrong with me because I missed my dad. I was depressed and a kid pulled my string. Well, I stayed in that classroom environment and it was like a dungeon. In fact, it was like a prison. It's in the bottom of the school, it's rank. And I was up one day for some air coming from the cafeteria, Miss Hastings, small frame, white woman with red hair. She was the toughest teacher in the school. She pulled me to the side and she said, come here. My teacher looked at her and just kept walking because she knew Ms. Hastings didn't play and she wasn't gonna ask her any questions. Ms. Hastings brought me to her classroom. She was a great math teacher. She gave me a math sheet. Must have been maybe on the first or second grade level. I knocked it out. She gave me another one. Second grade, third grade level, I knocked it out. She gave me another one and another one and another one, each one. I kept getting more and more confident because I felt like math was my favorite subject. Nobody had really challenged me, not academically. What she discovered is I wasn't a dumb kid and that I had capacity. And she said to me, son, what's two plus two? And I said, it's four. She told me to go to the corner, stand in the corner. She said, what's two plus two? I turned around nervously and I said, four. She said, come here and get under my desk. I said, oh my goodness. She said, what's two plus two? I said, four. She said, stand on top of my desk. I did. She said, what is two plus two? I said, four. She helped me down off her desk and she looked me right in the eye. And she said, you're going to be one of my students from now on. She said, I want you to know something. You're smart. She said, no matter where you go in life, whether it's in a corner, whether it's under a desk, on top of the world, knowledge is the one thing that no one can take away from you. You will always know what two plus two is. She inspired in me a desire to learn. She illuminated me. And inequities and intervening events changed the course of my life and they allowed me to see my purpose. So let's talk about what happened with fatherless boys and what happened with me. By the way, Best Academy, where I'm the principal, 69% of our boys go home every day to fatherless homes. Here's the data on fatherless homes. 63% do suicide, 71% dropouts. 85% of students who exhibit behavior disorders, that was me, in school, come from fatherless homes. We can give you a whole bunch of facts and figures about black students, about perception, and about students with disabilities who really don't have disabilities, who have to be restrained at school because they look older or less innocent. Also, I wanna share some scholarly articles. These articles are phenomenal. Unfortunately, with my limited time, I don't have a lot of time to go into them, but we will include them as a part of the uh, takeaways. Wanna make sure you see some of them though. Okay, so there's a famous, famous study that was done on perception by Jane Elliott. She's an amazing educator. I want you guys to take a few minutes to look at this. Today's audience was separated into two groups, not on the color of their skin where they separated when they arrive. They were separated based on the color of their eyes, but they have no idea that they were separated. What we did was treat each group differently, discriminating against the people who have blue eyes, catering to those people with brown eyes. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Put your eyes. Over there, put it on. No, no, 
no, no, no, over there. Over there. The blue-eyed people were pulled out of line, told to put on a green collar and wait outside. When the brown-eyed people arrived, they were told to step to the front of the line. Audience members with brown eyes were allowed to enjoy coffee and donuts. The blue-eyed group became upset when they saw the brown-eyed people were being seated first. Diversity expert Jane Elliott helped set up the experiment. I've been a teacher for 25 years in the public, private, and parochial schools in this country, and I have seen what brown-eyed people have done as compared to what blue-eyed people do. And it's perfectly obvious. And if I didn't believe it before this morning, you should have been here this morning when we brought these people in here. Feeling discriminated against, the blue-eyed audience members were visibly upset. She was rude to Very us, rude. all of us. Yelled at us, called us names, pushed us aside. She was rude. This one is say, why doesn't Jane have a green collar on? She She's got blue eyes. Because I've learned to act brown-eyed. I have a brown-eyed husband and three brown-eyed children. Why did you? And the message in this room is, act brown-eyed and you, too, can take off your collar. Act intelligently oh, and you, too, won't lose your collar. That's, None of you have, have acted intelligently yet. It wasn't long before the brown-eyed people bought into the idea that they were superior. You people. school who was blue-eyed. She was so stupid. She was always coughing off of my papers. These people were so rude and so noisy today, we couldn't hear any ourselves even talk. It was ridiculous. Eventually, the audience figured out the show was really about race. Now, he was so angry, he took off his collar way on early. How many of you people of color can take off the collar that we have put on you? How many of you can take off your color? But if a black male refuse to follow your orders or your husband's orders or your father's orders on the street, you would not see that as being highly principled. You would see him as being an uppity nigger. Well, we can see where this is going. She's saying that everybody has racism in them. It's not really about the eye. She's trying to teach about racism. But she can't get away from the fact that God created the races and you are going to be different. You can't help it. God to be like that. One race, the human race, and human beings created racism. We caught up with the mastermind behind the eye color test. Jane Elliott is her name, 22 years later. I love teaching. I started the blue eyed, brown eyed exercise because Martin Luther King Jr. had been one of our heroes of the month in February in my third grade classroom, and he was dead at the hands of an assassin. I hate to talk about this because every time I talk about it, I remember how it felt that day. I was going to have to go into my classroom and explain to my students why the adults in this country had allowed somebody to kill hope because Martin Luther King, for me, was hope for this country. I decided that the next day I was going to do what Hitler did. I was going to pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they had no control, separate them according to the color of their eyes, treat one group badly and treat the other group very well and see what would happen. Eye color and skin color are caused by the same chemical, melanin. There is no logic in judging people by the amount of a chemical in their skin. Pigmentation should have nothing to do with how you treat another person. But unfortunately, it does. Give me a child at the age of eight. Let me do that exercise. And that child has changed forever. All right, guys. Poignant. So what's the answer? Well, first of all, education can eradicate ignorance. But secondly, the answer is simple, but it's complex. We have a Christian duty to build and not destroy. I'll give you a few seconds to read The Bridge Builder. So, the answer, everywhere you see 
a word in orange, I want you to put black person. The rapids held no fears for a black person. To that fair haired black person, may a pitfall be. That black person too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. So, visibility. I think it's important that we begin to consciously be aware of those things that we don't normally see. Let's take a look at this. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? It's easy to miss something you're not looking for, guys. We now see the bear. With social media, we now bring to light those things that were not consciously uh, visible to us, that we were not consciously aware of. And guess what? Visibility brings communities together. People all over the world are in protest. I don't know if any of these people are Christians, but I do know that they're peacemakers. I think that uh, I agree with, with all of what you guys are saying. It's, it's remarkable to see players have an opportunity to come together and that uh, this show and Maria has given them that platform to be able to express how they feel. And I think it's great. I, I also think that if, if you're a white player in these locker rooms, I think it's incumbent upon you to really help with the change. I saw Dylan Bowles there from Stanford involved. And I think, uh, you know, Trevor I, uh, Lawrence at Clemson has been involved. I think it's one thing to, to have rallies. It's, a, it's one thing to skip a practice because of social injustice. It's one thing for the NBA and the NFL uh, to miss games, to, to make a statement. Those things are great. But my question is, what's next? What, what, what does that lead to? You go back to practice the next day. Um, what, what will lead to change? And I really think, I was talking to David Shaw, the head coach at Stanford, uh, who, who really, he and I had a great talk. I love listening to, to his wisdom and his thoughts. And he shared a, a, a quote uh, to me and reminded me from Benjamin Franklin. He said, justice will be served. Justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And I think that that's what I mean when I think I, our, the, the black community is hurting if you've listened and the, the word empathy and compassion over these last four months, how do you listen to these stories and not feel pain and, and not, not want to help? You know what I mean? It's like the, wearing a hoodie and uh, putting your putting your, your hands up 10 and 2. Oh, God, I better look out because I'm, I'm, I'm wearing Nike gear. Like, what? What are we talking about? And so you can't relate to that if you're white, but you can listen and you can try to help because this is not okay. It's just not. It's not. And uh, we just have, we gotta do better, man. We, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta like lock arm in arm and be together in a football locker room that stuff is gone. It, those barriers are gone. And, uh, it just, we got to do better. So what? Now what? Justice will not be served to those who are unaffected or as outraged as those who are. Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fa fathers who actually opposed slavery. If we know better, we must do better. And finally, many of you may not know what to do, but you know something 
must be done. Thank you so much.